Hello everyone. So welcome to the session. I'm your session host, I'm Manisha. We have one talk today that's going to last one and a half hours. We're going to have three speakers. That's going to be Andrew, Christoph, and William. Andrew is the author of Wikipedia Revolution. Christoph is the vice chair of uh, Wikimedia France. And William is the author of Wikipedia blog. I would hand over the presentation to William. Thank right. you. Well, actually, I'll be handing it over to Andrew to start quickly. So. <laughs> Great, thanks for coming, and it's great to see so much uh, enthusiasm, or I don't know about enthusiasm, I say interest in this topic, because you may not be enthused about the paid editing part, but you might be interested in the paid editing part. But we've been uh, having Wikimania for 10 years now, and we've never really had a full session on paid editing in Wikipedia and all the issues around it, so I'm really happy to have this for the first time, and it was through the effort of, of um, many folks like uh, like uh, Christoph, to push this issue forward more. And over the last year, it's become even more and more important in all of our Wikipedia and Wikimedia projects. So we titled this, We Need to Talk About Paid Editing, because for too long, it was the unspoken debate. Um, it was cut and dry what we should or should not do. But we'd argue that there's something uh, different that we need to start thinking about in terms of the sophistication of whether we accept paid editing in Wikipedia, whatever that means. So. First, let's talk a little bit about the ghosts of paid editing past. So this is almost like a, a, a story in three acts. And act one is where have we come from and where are we now, right? So the history of COI editing, a little bit of navel gazing, but there actually is an article in Wikipedia called the history of paid editing in Wikipedia, I believe, right? <laughs> so um, you can actually read up on it. And believe it or not, it's a really well-documented uh, article about all the cases where so-called paid editors were caught editing Wikipedia. So you can see some very famous uh, cases from the past, including number one, uh, which some of you might know about if you look back in the history of when Jimmy edited his own page and even admitted later on, yeah, I probably shouldn't have done that. Um, you've seen cases like um, the recent case of WikiPR. But in between, we've had a lot of interesting things that have informed uh, Wikipedia stance towards paid editing. So we're going to take a look at some of these and then talk about what has developed in this past year that has really been a breakthrough on Wikipedia. So um, Wikipedia COI, if you've ever looked at the conflict of interest statement on Wikipedia, it's uh, fairly uh, extensive now, but William found something quite interesting about this. So I decided to go find the very first version of this uh, guideline because as Andrew says, it's very well developed now, but like every Wikipedia page, it had a, you know, an early version that was not as well developed, a lot more ad hoc. And so here's what the page looked like in the very first place. It was actually called Vanity Page at that point, but it was uh, then moved over to Conflict of Interest. Uh, funny enough, the, account, the, the, the guideline was created by an editor who was later banned for sock puppetry. <laughs> and for those of you who've been around Wikipedia for a long time, the editor who uh, banned that other editor was the infamous SJ, not the SJ that we still like it is around, but uh, <laughs> the other one, the one who was in the New Yorker. So right, so E-S-S-J-A-Y -E was ironically the guy who blocked him, right? So Not long before he exited with the so. <laughs> Right. So this is the WPCOI, the first version. Um, but I wanted to put this diagram up because I think it helps explain why this is actually quite a bit more complicated than saying, if you're paid, don't edit. If you're unpaid, you're free to edit. And the reason why I like this is because it actually divides the issue into different, uh, different parameters. One is, are you paid or are you unpaid? And the other axis here is, are you conflicted or are you unconflicted? Because you'll realize that we actually have four quadrants here that, that could actually classify different types of editors. Right? We can actually have, in the upper left-hand corner, a paid editor. And we're seeing more and more, as Glam is a whole track here at Wikimania, that we actually have folks whose 24, I'm not 20, 40 hour a week job and their vocation is to be paid to engage Wikipedia. They're paid, sometimes editors, sometimes uploaders, sometimes not editors, but participants in our community. And we'd like to think they're unconflicted because if they're working for a cultural institution that is like-minded, their values align perfectly with Wikipedia's, right? Knowledge in the public interest, uh, neutrality, verifiability, and um, abiding by our guidelines, they can be very productive paid contributors of Wikipedia, not only productive, but essential for the future of Wikipedia, right? So we have Wikipedians in residence at the National Archives in the United States, all over 
uh, Europe, uh, Liam Wyatt of Euro Europeana. So lots of different ways to be paid and unconflicted. The ones that we tend not to really like in Wikipedia are the paid and conflicted folks, right? So these are your uh, stereotypical PR uh, operatives that want to erase embarrassing information in corporate articles or want to uh, try to delete something about their employer or their boss so that it doesn't read as embarrassing in the article. And then on the lower part here, you can have unpaid and unconflicted contributors. And generally, that's you folks, right? Folks who volunteer their time. They're, uh, you're unpaid, but you believe in Wikipedia's principles and you improve Wik Wikipedia and the Wikimedia projects because of your belief in the principles and you follow them. But then something that we all kind of know but maybe never thought about as much is that you can actually have unpaid conflicted editors, right? So these are either POV warriors, people pushing a certain point of view, right? So some folks who are passionate about a religion or a viewpoint. But the funny thing is, and I wrote an essay about this a few years ago, we actually tolerate and don't have a solution for a whole range of unpaid conflicted editing. And my favorite example is if you look at the articles about colleges and universities, they read like brochures for those institutions, right? It's always X college is ranked number three in the mid-Atlantic states and has a famous football team, et cetera, et cetera. It's always a glowing first two paragraphs for these universities. They're systemically biased to be good. Why? Because there's thousands and thousands of alumnus or alumni of these universities and probably only a handful of people pushing back on it. So we actually have this problem of systemic bias, of unpaid, conflicted advocates in Wikipedia that we just have to tolerate. And we kind of say, well, we can kind of deal with it, but it, we know that this is a problem long term. Yes, quick. Are you taking comments and questions while we're going through? We're going to try to go through each section, and then maybe we'll take some co questions and comments. I'm sorry? I very strongly disagree with Pastor Pastor. OK, well, we can debate that. We have 90 minutes, which is great. Right? Yeah. So, um, so here's some examples of those types of uh, editors that we have in the community. So part of the problem is that one of the more famous episodes in Wikipedia's history was a just a tool that one of the folks out there who had some programming chops created called Wikiscanner. And he just said, well, what if we took all the anonymous or IP edits in Wikipedia and just tried to correlate where those IP addresses came from? And this is the beginning of a lot of interesting reporting on uh, so-called you know, IP edits because they found that there was editing happening from corporations, from both houses of Congress, from Parliament, from all kinds of places you didn't think uh, editing should be coming from, right? So the wiki scanner, which does not really operate anymore, um, but operates in different ways and different tools, was a pretty important part of Wikipedia's history to uncover what kind of uh, IP edits were happening in Wikipedia. Um, another famous case was the Bell Pottinger case, where there was a British PR firm caught deleting negative information from clients' pages in 2011. And that led directly to the public relations group here in the UK um, creating a guideline for best practices for public relations companies. And then just last year, the thing that erupted, at least in the United States, was the case of WikiPR, a boutique so-called PR or communications firm that was caught uh, employing folks off of freelance sites and not disclosing that they were employing these folks and even going to the point of creating fake news sites so that these folks who are updating the articles could point to these news sites and say, hey, look, here's a news report that confirms what I want to put in. And even, which I thought was quite slick, going to the point of going to CNN iReport, which is their citizen journalism site, and then planning stories on CNN iReport, because then they could say, hey, it's been published on CNN, so it's valid. And then finally, just in the last few months, one of our Wikimedia DC members, who's quite savvy, just decided to, hey, what happens if I made a Twitter bot that just looked at all the edits made to Wikipedia from IP addresses in the US Congress? And that got a lot of headlines recently, because suddenly you saw people updating some, some strange articles uh, from within the halls of Congress. So these are just some recent examples of how we see some of these things manifest themselves in Wikipedia. And then what we want to do is make sure everyone knows about these two efforts that in recent years have been um, useful in engaging Wikipedians with the um, PR and the communications field. So one of them that you might know about is something called the Corporate, Represent Corporate Representatives for Ethical Wikipedia Engagement, or CREW. This is actually nothing more than a Facebook group where 
there are some PR professionals that have taken the time to learn Wikipedia's guidelines and try to work within Wikipedia's policies are part of that group. And then also a lot of Wikipedians like myself and Bill and maybe some folks in the audience. How many people here in the audience have engaged with crew in some way? Good. Good. And I encourage you to just go to the Facebook group and, and go there. It's generally pretty friendly. We share clips and discuss issues around uh, paid editing and conflicted editing. Um, and you'll find it's a, it's a pretty congenial group in general. Um, but one of the things that we'll show later on is the fact that um, Phil Gomes, who helped start that group, created a flowchart to help some folks in the PR industry as they start to learn Wikipedia policies to navigate a lot of our intricacies. Uh, uh, of the process that we have. And then the Charter Institute for Public Relations, this is what I described before after the Bell Pottinger case. Um, this became a lot more well known that the UK uh, Trade Association for Public Relations um, came out with a pretty good guide and I believe just last month in July they've updated that to 2.0 with some more details. So that's actually a nice PDF file that you can download and it has things that specifically say, you know, if you are thinking of engaging Wikipedia by direct editing, that is not a best practice. And I believe the term dark arts was used in that document to say, don't do that. Right. So that's pretty refreshing for Wikipedians to see that the pro professional group is basically telling their members, don't directly edit Wikipedia, learn about other ways to um, voice your concerns in the community. So this is, as we said, Phil Gomes, one of the folks who started Crew. It's imperative that the public relations industry demonstrate by cooperation and good behavior that it can work with the Wikipedia community instead of taking the quick, easy, fix-it route. Okay, so I thought this year has been really important because we not only have Crew to have open a dialogue with the PR industry, but Bill's going to describe the meeting that we had in Washington, D.C., where I was one of about four Wikipedians who went to this meeting, and I was quite skeptical. And you know, I teach journalism as a profession. I've taught in departments where they have a PR department. We've always had kind of, as journalists, an uneasy relationship with public relations and public relations professionals. So I had my skeptical hat on. But I was quite pleased that m almost all the folks who participate in this meeting, of maybe a dozen PR professionals, all had this attitude that they valued Wikipedia's role in the public sphere and they wanted to respect the guidelines that Wikipedia had. Whereas without this meeting, without engaging with PR professionals, we as Wikipedians always think the worst of PR professionals or the industry, where you always see them as folks wanting to sneak in behind the scenes and alter every article that they can without us knowing it. And I think opening up the dialogue and not having a Cold War anymore, but having face-to-face -face interaction makes a lot of sense. So this is an example of that crew flowchart that Phil Gomes and other folks in the crew group have tried to create. It may look quite twisty and quite complex. Believe it or not, it's only a fraction of what you really need to know to engage Wikipedia um, as you and I, as Wikipedians, know how to interact with it. So even some folks who saw this said, you guys are making things too complex. If you read this, it's actually really much simpler than what you need to understand to engage fully with Wikipedia. But it's a good start, and I appreciate the fact that Phil and other folks have tried to take a step-by-step uh, -step instruction guide uh, approach to this. So here's some examples of that, right? So this flowchart, if you're used to computer programming, is typical of what you have with diamonds and boxes here. But this is the, the big headline. If you um, are wanting to uh, challenge something on a Wikipedia page and you're a PR professional, make your case in the talk page, disclosing your COI, give your rationale, post the current text, and propose your text and sources um, but that's it, don't directly edit the article. So um, you can take a look at this chart and it's part of that crew group where these files are uh, available. So um, if we have some quick questions, we'll take them. Otherwise, we will have time at the end to address a lot of these questions. So, yes. Um, quick disclosure, I'm a friend of Greg Code. Okay. Um, his point would be to this, that you're kind of drugging underground and you can do all this kind of good stuff and it looks, looks great, but people will do it in other ways. And there's still an, um, I don't know whether that's the point of your talk or later, but yeah, there is this problem. I mean, I, I'm currently engaging with um, another editor and there is strong evidence that that editor is being paid by an Indian diplomat. There is strong evidence, but not conclusive evidence. And that person will use all the conflict of interest guidelines, he will use all the sort of assume good faith stuff, and it's very, very, very hard to challenge. 
it is also very, very hard to challenge the Wikipedia policy where harassment always trumps conflict of interest. How do you address that problem? Bill, do you have any opinions on that? So, I, that's an interesting question. There certainly are hard cases, and I've definitely encountered plenty of them myself. There are times where, you know, it doesn't always work very well, no question. Uh, I don't know that, you know, that, that conflict of interest is seen as being worse than harassment. Um, I do, I'm going to be again, I always depends Sorry, on... Sorry, so let me just clarify yeah, this. Every yeah. time the editor has challenged, there's a long history of this, and, yeah. and we're at this place now. You say, you're harassing me. He says, oh, you're writing about it on Wikipedia or something like that. Mm -hmm. every, every little button he or she can press is pressing. That there was a general tendency to give the benefit of the doubt to the person who's claiming harassment. That, that, that to me is a problem. Yeah, no, I, that's, that's not a problem. I, on Wikipedia, it's always that, that the sixth pillar is the person that cares the most wins. And it sounds like the person who's on the other side of that issue is highly motivated and unethical. And I, I feel for it. These things do happen. Right. Um, the woman in the back who had questions. Yep. That's good. Yeah. Um, now, not at all ways unconflicted. Hmm. I would actually put them much closer to original research than fighting for their own particular institution. The mm -hmm. issue, as I would break that chart down, is not really a conflicted, but it's the fact that you are talking about particular subjects. If you're in the British Library, then fine. As long as you're talking about library books and stuff in that library and using that as reference and uploading it, I don't think anybody would complain. If somebody from the British Library happened to be talking about a particular publisher mm -hmm. and how their history had been, I think we would consider them conflicted. Right. It's not straightforward sections. Yeah, I, and I think I'm in agreement with you. Of course, that's a very blunt categorization that I had up there, right? Because yeah. if you look at like Lori Phillips, she's the w Glam Wiki US coordinator. She actually says, by default, you probably shouldn't edit Wikipedia directly if you're a Glam professional, right? So certain folks can because her partner, Dominic, does edit Wikipedia directly and he's a Glam professional. So even in that same family, they have different philosophies on whether Glam professionals should or should not edit, right? There are systems in place to, to deal with this, especially if they have visited. Uh, at least the, that's I'm from Wikimedia South Africa, particular editor in South Africa topics. Um, especially with South African companies, um, and companies just in general, they're pretty ham-fisted about how they deal with stuff on mm -hmm. Wikipedia. And generally it's things like, there's a criticism page that pops up on their Wikipedia page, and they just delete it all, and they don't give a reason why. Right. So there, in, in those cases, it's very easy to spot, yeah, this is vandalism, and then you just go through a, a process where you politely inform the anonymous IP address, or if they're smart enough to do a username, you politely inform them, mm -hmm. and, you know, thank you for editing, and, uh, but you made this edit and it's incorrect, but don't worry, we have reversed it and if you've got any questions, go here. And when they repeat themselves, then, 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 then you, you follow um, another process of the, you know, the order to protect all that sort of stuff. And, and eventually other editors usually come along and uh, do an investigation of these guys, their soft puppeting, their, their battles, etc. Where, where, it's, where it's more um, uh, insidious is when uh, you've got a, a very familiar Wikipedia editor, and, and I've never come across this, mm -hmm. but it's probably because it's just so uh, under the radar. Um, and they're not doing things like just getting rid of the criticisms, but they're just... Um, more they're subtle, more, more nuanced subtle. changes, they're yeah. Um, and and I'm sure Wikipedia is a big place, I'm sure there are people around out there. Yeah, know. I'm sure. Um, they're just neglecting to add certain points of view, mm -hmm. or they, they, they dumb down the criticism by replacing um, uh, certain references with other references that might overlook or play down, you know. The yeah. To that, I would say there may also be very legitimate reasons to do that too. Absolutely. This is why you want to. This why you want to have an open dialogue to discuss what should be in the issue and or what should be in the article. How should the sources be developed? I mean, this is why a, a, a thread you will see throughout this entire presentation is that it, this needs to be a conversation. It needs to be a conversation that. Wiki Wikipedians feel comfortable having with representatives of companies. We want representatives of companies to feel like they can come to Wikipedia and get a fair hearing. The fellow here who's friends with Greg Coase, I, I mean, I know Coase's position is not going to get a fair hearing, not even going to try. I, I think that's unfortunate. I, I, I see where he's coming from. I just, just disagree with it. But let's move on to part two where we talk about what's happening more presently uh, in terms of Wikipedia and companies. Uh, I will start this by talking a bit about my own background. 
so I started editing Wikipedia in 2006, around the same time as I went to go work at a social media marketing firm in Washington, D.C., where I live. And this was a time where everybody was starting to focus on Twitter and Facebook, because Twitter and Facebook roll out the red carpet for marketers. Come do your marketing on our platforms, and Wikipedia is the complete opposite. Uh, but I found Wikipedia fascinating on a personal level and have continued to edit ever since then. Um, but, you know, I also uh, had clients who had articles that were not very good, and these companies were expressly disinvited from contributing to those articles. But then the Wikipedia community didn't really care to work on those articles either, because they were focused on issues of actual interest to them, and for whatever reason, for-profit businesses are not those, unless those businesses are Apple or Google or either particularly famous or particularly no notorious companies. Uh, so I started to put this together. Uh, back then, I you know, created an account and I started to negotiate changes with editors. At this point in time, I would make direct edits if I felt like I had consensus. You know, I read that conflict of interest guideline on the English Wikipedia that says, you are strongly discouraged. Okay, so you're not banned from doing it. You, basically, it says, if you're gonna do it, you got to know what you're doing. And I figured, I know what I'm doing. Did enough of this, uh, I wanted to keep developing it further. So in 2010, I left my job there and hung out my own shingle, as we like to say in DC, and started up my own one-man consultancy. Uh, taking on clients, doing this exact thing. Uh, actually, in early 2012, uh, around the time that the Jimmy Wales announced his Brightline position, um, I ran into an incident where I got yelled at pretty hard by a couple of editors because they did not like some changes that I made to an entry. Here, I had a client where I included some criticism, but they felt like I didn't include enough criticism. And so this was a long argument, but actually it ended up in the article becoming a featured article by the end of the day, so it, it worked out. And uh, from early 2012 to the present, uh, I've always, I, I have since followed the bright line. We don't make direct edits for clients. We go to talk pages and argue for uh, new changes. Have we been successful doing this? We've been so successful doing this that my company has grown to the point where we, out of a staff of 15, where we're also doing visual design and content marketing, we have six folks who are working on client pages, talking to them about what are their goals for an entry, what goals they have are compatible with Wikipedia's goals of creating an encyclopedia. We will research material, we'll write it, and uh, either we will represent the company to Wikipedia or we will coach someone from their communications team on how to work with volunteer editors. Um, this is what I do uh, a lot. I like talking about it, but I will move on to talk um, more generally. The Bright Line, I mentioned this before. Um, the Bright Line is interesting. This is uh, actually, anybody, ra please raise your hand if you've not heard of the Bright Line. Okay, so in 2012, Jimmy Wales, uh, after following the Bell Pottinger case Andrew talked about, uh, he was moved to make a more definitive statement on his views of how paid contributors should be viewed in the community. Jimmy's position in the past had been, don't do it, just stay away, go away, we don't want you here. Problem is, uh, prohibition doesn't work, and Wikipedia was an attractive nuisance. If it's at the top of your Google search results and it gets you wrong, you know, as Jimmy Wales said at the time that he got caught editing his own page, if you see something wrong, you really want to change it. That's not in itself <coughs> wrong, but there is a protocol to getting it right. So Jimmy put together a protocol, called it the Bright Line. It says if you are a paid consultant, or paid advocate is his term, then don't edit articles at all. Kind of an extreme position, never, never even though the conflict of interest guideline on the English Wikipedia allows certain kinds of direct edits if you have a conflict. If it's a BLP issue, if you're reverting vandalism, that says it's okay. If I'm interpreting Jimmy correctly and I have not had a personal conversation with it, he's saying, I don't care. If you're paid, don't. But the flip side is, if you are paid, you should feel comfortable going to a talk page, presenting arguments for things to change, and you should get a fair hearing. Part of the problem with the Bright Line is that it can be difficult to get a fair hearing. Volunteers are still volunteers who put their own time on Wikipedia, have their own projects, and so it can be a bit of a challenge to get somebody to put their time and attention on your issue. These are some of the endemic issues. Um, but here's a specific quote. Uh, this is one of several quotes. This is the most concise summary. Uh, I am opposed to allowing paid advocates to edit in article space at all but I'm extremely supportive of giving them other helpful paths to assist us. 
if that paid professional can contribute toward the project of building an encyclopedia, then they are welcome to do so, again, so long as they follow this, this protocol. I should add, this is not a policy, not a guideline. It's just, just Jimmy's opinion. But he, and even though he has, at, at most, a seat on the board, you know, no one would argue that he doesn't still have the largest bully pulpit in all of Wikipedia. People still go to his discussion page for his user account to hash out issues. You know, uh, if, if Jimmy Wales didn't exist, Wikipedia would need to create him. Um, so this is where he's the, he's the most authoritative voice on this. He'll never get it through past policy. He'll never get it past this policy. Policies really can't be added to Wikipedia anymore. Just can't get consensus for them. But to the extent that there's consensus around this, and there's not entirely, there are people who think that this goes too far. There's an even smaller minority that just wants PR people to really just stay away. Um, this operates as default policy. It's the best practice, as he calls it, and I'm inclined to agree with that. So Andrew previewed a project that I've been working on this last year, trying to bring the PR and Wikipedia communities closer together. In February, I brought together a, a roundtable group at the Donovan House Hotel in Washington, DC. Uh, as Andrew says, there's about four uh, Wikipedia editors. There was about eight people from the digital practices of uh, large PR firms, including Burson Marsteller, Ogilvy, uh, Fleischman Hilliard, and Edel Edelman, and you name a big one, they were very likely there. I'm leaving out some very big ones. Um, you know, I had a hunch. I had a hunch that if I brought Wikipedians together in the same room with, with PR folks, they would actually see that they had more in common than they thought. You know, I think Wikipedians sometimes have this straw person idea of a PR you know, professional who's slick and trying to put one over on the public, and they certainly do exist, but I, I would submit that they are the minority. Most PR people are just trying to get their, uh, their, their clients' stories heard. And if they can put that story into the form of an encyclopedia entry, then Wikipedia is a place where they can actually get something done. So I had this conversation, and I, I brought it together because after WikiPR, after Bell Pottinger, I just frustrated that the only time anybody ever talked about PR in Wikipedia, or the only time it ever made the news, was when someone got their hand caught in the proverbial cookie jar. So this was a step toward trying to get some better attention on it. This wasn't widely publicized. I talked to a lot of people, invited more people than could come. But this I wanted to have, an invitation-based, friendly discussion, and see what we could put together out of it. This is what primarily came out of it. A joint statement. Uh, I wrote a first draft, and then with all of the participants from that February meeting, we did several rounds of revisions in order to get the leadership of these agencies they represented to sign on to say that they would essentially respect Wikipedia's rules and uh, we released this in June. Here, is, here are the bullets from the previous slide. Uh, these identify the, the key things that these agencies agreed upon. First one, to better understand you know, what Wikipedia means as a movement and as a project. Specifically, follow the policies and guidelines, especially the ones surrounding conflict of interest. The terms of use, which you know, uh, folks are probably aware that uh, the Wikimedia Foundation very recently updated the terms of use to make it absolutely required to disclose your paid interest. Um, we released this a week before that. I, I knew that I was in conversation, but I did not know that that was going to be coming out the week later. So when people asked me, how does that affect this? I was like, no, we, uh, I, this is future-proofed against that. Like, we are already following that, that rule. Um, you know, I, when, look, this statement does not mean that people at these companies are never going to do the bad thing again. Bad things will happen. Individual people will make edits that their superiors uh, you know, either didn't know that they shouldn't ask for or didn't know about. And when it happens, when it's caught, this should be dealt with in the same manner that one would deal with any violation of a, a company ethics guideline. These PR companies a lot of, put a lot of effort into their ethics policies. They also don't always follow them. It's just, it's the nature of the beast. And it's unfortunate, but it's, it's the real world. But where they catch them, where we can, and here's where you as Wikipedians can be, I'm sure you were already watching for a funny business, but know that if a company has signed on to this group and you can identify the, that a company from this, from this statement is behind an edit, like you should make, put that together, like let them know that uh, because 
they, they, they've already said they wouldn't. Um, and of course, lastly, to publicize our views, we want to get this out there, hence this panel for one thing. So when we announced it in uh, June of 2010, by the end of the day, that first day, we had 11 agencies signed to it. So again, Ogilvy, Fleischmann, Burson Marsteller, Ketchum, Portnovelli, Edelman, uh, these are some of the largest firms in the world. Edelman by itself is far and away the biggest, uh, well, standalone agency. For those of you who don't know a lot about PR, there are these two large British firms that own almost every single other PR firm in the world. So like Ogilvy and Burson Marsteller are bo both owned by Omnicom. Uh, no, not Omnicom, um, WPP here in the, the UK. And then several of these others are owned by Omnicom. And then there's a French one called Publicis that owns even more. Edelman's the only one that is uh, standalone, not owned by anybody else. But all, these are all pretty big, except for my company, which is much, 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 much smaller than the others. <laughs> um, by, by the time we're having this conversation here, we now have 35 uh, companies signed on to it. Uh, we added, uh, so Hill & Knowlton is another WPP company. Uh, they were part of the original uh, group discussion and took them a little bit longer to get their approval. Uh, I'm glad that they like really ran the traps. They really like took it all the way to the top and made sure that their executives understood what it meant. Um, we definitely had to make changes to the, you know, to the statement in order to get everybody agreed to it. There was, it was an interesting, interesting way to balance different views. But once it was released, it is set, and we ideally want every public relations firm that is capable of following these rules to join it. So we're inviting anybody to join. We also advise, make sure that you have the agreement of the top brass of the company. Make sure that you are starting to put together you know, methods of enforcement and methods of communicating this to your team members, whether you are a company of 10 people or 10,000 people. Um, obviously more of a challenge if you're 10,000 people, and that's, essentially, that's a, especially where you will see companies trip up. So it, when we released this, uh, a couple of days later, I got a call from a reporter who told me that they had heard that someone from one of the companies on this list had made an edit that they you know, clearly shouldn't have made. And to that I said, you know, I knew this was going to happen, I just didn't know it would happen this fast. And yeah, it's going to keep happening, but this is at least, here's a sign pointing in the right direction. Um, you know, the reaction from the, oops, did I sip one? Oh, so the reaction from, I mean, we had a lot of press for this, that's for certain. Uh, we also even got um, MSL Group, which is one of the uh, agencies signed to it, based in France. Uh, here's a memo that they circulated internally at the company, and internally, globally. I mean, this one's in English, I assume there were other language versions, saying, so there's the bullet points, these are the things you need to agree to. Then down at the bottom, they have some additional advice on how to uh, follow it. So if you are currently editing a page, here's what you should do. Go to the talk page, disclose your interest, that sort of thing. Um, I've been very, very happy with the uh, response to it. Um, like I say, we got a ton of coverage from Wall Street Journal to uh, PR Week uh, on this side of the pond as well. Um, CIPR, which released the, um, the, the great best practices guide of a couple of years ago, also signed on to it in a um, kind of an advisory capacity. Um, which I was very, very happy about, and they've been great to work with on this. Um, that is that. By the way, one last thing about this before I turn it over to Christoph. Um, this is not the end of the project. This was the beginning of the project. This was a first statement from the agencies to the Wikipedia community saying, we haven't always got this right, but we are learning. We want to learn more. We want to get it right. So if you are open to a dialogue with us, then we are definitely open to a dialogue with you. So I'll have more about where I'm taking it next in a little bit. But next, Christophe's going to talk about uh, some of the work that he's done on the French Wikipedia. Oh, there you go. Hi. <laughs> what? Um, I'm Christophe Henner, I'm Vice Chair of Wikimedia France. I also used to be a consultant for an advertising marketing uh, agency and now I'm head of marketing for a media company. So I actually have been on the two sides of the fence, being a Wikimedian for nine years now, I think, and being in a company that is actually making marketing and communication. Um, I started making talks at Wiki in Wikimedia about companies and pet editing in 2010, I think. And last year I had two tracks about that. 
Um, the reason behind that is we are seeing companies are evil and that we shouldn't interact with them when in fact companies have been uh, part of the economic history of the world and some of them have huge archives that we could use. They're not museums, but they have archives. And I'm not putting that there, but I used to work for a bank that the owner was, a fun the family of the owner was in love with art. And in fact, the, um, the office of this bank was, had a curator. And it was virtually, it was a museum that was only accessed by the top brass of the company. And this was sitting in, a, in, a, in an office in Paris, only accessed by perhaps 20 people, and nobody has access to its art. We can work with company. Uh, I'm going to bring a point of view which is slightly different with what we've seen before. Uh, to show you that when we're talking about paid editing for a few months now, a few years, uh, the discussion is culturally biased by the English Wikipedia. Uh, all the discussion we're having are about paid editing on the English Wikipedia and paid editing with the culture in the US, not even the culture in the UK, but the US culture of the relationship with companies. Uh, I'm not, I will not talk about the regulation of companies because it's a conversation we actually had yesterday. Uh, the regulation of companies regarding communication <coughs> in the US, which is virtually non-existent, which is not the same in Europe. So the relationship to companies and PR and communication and company communication is very different when you are in Europe and the US. And this is really important. Uh, the first thing is, uh, a few years ago, well, for IFA, I made a study of the top 40 companies in France and just look at the quality of those articles to see, not even if they were good, but if they went above the, 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 state, uh, the step of being a stub. And all the 40 articles, I mean, you can see, it was a, a um, grade 1 to 100, 100 being like, okay, it's an article that is good enough. And the average was under 50 because most of them were stubs. The reason behind that is our community is not interested in editing articles but companies. We are not. It bores us, so we don't do that. Uh, I use that to just to show that if we are not, use, if you're not doing it and if we don't make, uh, if we don't have a framework to let company help us improve those articles, we have a wall side of knowledge and history which is not taken care of, which is the one related to the company history. Um, so I have an example in French Wikipedia, uh, Orange. Orange is a huge telecommunication firm, and they have taken on improving their article on the French Wikipedia and the English Wikipedia. So I invite you to go on the English uh, Wikipedia of Orange and look at it, and a good part of it has been written by the company. And the interesting thing is that the, they publish it over uh, a couple of weeks, and nothing they published was reverted. Everything stayed. And a few years after, it was a year, one year and a half or two years, I don't remember, uh, the content they put in there is still there. It has been changed, it has been improved, it's still there. And the interesting thing on the French Wikipedia, after two weeks of editing, an editor came to the village pump and said, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, they are editing their own article, we should delete everything they did. And what happened is the person in charge uh, of that in Orange came to the village pump and said, I, I am working for Orange and I edited the article and this is everything I did and all the process I followed and if I did anything bad, if there is a lack of references, just tell me. And then something absolutely wonderful happened. The next comment. The next comment was an highly, highly iron call comment about the very first person saying deal to everything and he was saying basically Oh, poor of you, you came and you said openly that you were working for the company, you made the best to effort to follow the rules, you tried to be neutral, you even improved the part about criticism and so on and so on and so on. And you are being yelled at. Okay, forget about the guy, you did everything that you should have, and this is the page you should look at if you want to keep on going. And all the other comments are basically saying, there's no problem. The whole editions that has been made, the all edits that has been made were following NPOV and references, even improving the part about criticism. And we were in the middle of a kind of a shitstorm about Orange and suicides, which was a big story in France. And everybody was like, okay, they're following the rules. Who cares who they are? They follow the rules. They are improving Wikipedia. And this is something that is really, really different between the English Wikipedia and a lot of other Wikipedia. Uh, this is one sentence from the, that is 
summing up the French conflict of interest uh, policy. And basically, it's important to distinguish the need with uh, COI that it's promotion for one fixing a mistake. Meaning that if someone has a conflict of interest, it doesn't mean that he will make promotional edits. It can make good edits. And you have to look at what edits makes. Having a COI doesn't mean that everything you do is going to be bad. Having a COI says that, well, you have a COI. We all have. When I'm editing the article about my great uncle that was a painter, I have a COI. They do, but they can make great, great stuff. And this part of our COI totally allows by the policy to have companies editing their own article directly. What the French community mainly will care about is, is it neutral? It is using sources and good sources. So it is, as we said, we uh, want to have a discussion about paid editing. The discussion we have been having for a few years was about paid editing on the English Wikipedia, not paid editing on Wikipedia or on the Wikimedia projects. And even though the conflict of interest policy is on French Wikipedia is good. Actually, how we are seeing Wikipedia as project or Wikimedia projects as, as project, as platform, are not fit for organizations. Not even just company, but for organization as well. Most of the Wikipedia, for example, doesn't allow to have a group username. You have, a username must be linked to one person. It can be a username for an organization. Uh, it cannot be a username for many people. And it even leads company to waste resources in order to free knowledge, free knowledge. Uh, so this is something that happens so in France, Yamaha. So this one was about Ma Yamaha motor, so motorcycle. Um, the French chair, so I, I used to consult for this company. Uh, the chair was leaving. It was the one that brought y Yamaha in France 60 years ago. He was leaving and he said, yeah, I'm leaving, but I'm not leaving any, any vis visible trace of what we've done in France for the last 100 years. So how could I share the history of Yamaha in France? Let's put that on wiki. But then we delve into the wiki policies and uh, we figure out that it was not possible. So they actually spent months developing a wiki, which is under a free license, which allows anyone to edit. And I'm sure that is reminding some to, so something for Wikipedia. It's exactly the same. Same license, same rules, anyone can edit. But as they couldn't have a Yamaha account, uh, they would have had a uh, hard time to make articles about some specific topics. They created a new wiki and put that in there. The wiki is still active. They are still contributing to that. They are still digitizing hundreds of pictures because they have them, but they're not putting them on Wikipedia because it's too hard. It's even sometimes impossible. And by preventing, in fact, uh, companies to have a framework when they can operate on Wikimedia projects, virtually, well, eventually, we are destroying knowledge. Because right now, the archive, the paper and picture archive that are sitting and dusting in some 100 years old company won't last forever. There could be a flood, there could be a fire, or they could just get rid of them. And by not having that framework, at some point, we might lose that knowledge. And I think I'm... Oh, yeah. And the thing, yeah, good. And the thing, we, we did have to do that because of the username policy. And again, the discussion we should have is more global because the German Wikipedia is not having that issue because they allow verified accounts. You could create an account for a group of people and have it verified through OTRS, and then you have a verified account for an organization. So I believe it's really important for us to keep in mind that right now when we are talking about paid editing, and this word really is not the good one, uh, we are talking about, actually, we are talking about paid editing on the English Wikipedia, not paid editing on Wikimedia Commons, not wiki paid editing on French Wikipedia, German Wikipedia, and so on. And this is something to keep in mind because it can work. And we have, I mean, I have some examples, and I know uh, in Germany they have, and in Sweden and Swedish they have, examples of companies that are actually editing following our rules, which is all we need to care in the end. And I think I'm good for, should it take it? Yeah, I just said that. Oh, you did, okay. huh, not listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> Bad you. Should I say, let's say, Christian, or we take questions yeah, okay. now? Yeah, okay, so, um, well, actually, we have another case study. Let's do the other case study, because after that, it's going to be mostly a discussion, or I did. So we have uh, Christian and Federico, uh, who worked on a project for, uh, well, I will let them talk about it, actually. <laughs> I, um, 
I'm Christian from uh, Wikimedia Italy, and this is Federico from Telecom Italia. We are going to thanks. We have uh, huge fans over there, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> and we are to, uh, going to talk about this uh, project that involves Telecom Italia, which uh, is, to our knowledge, the first project that actually involves a company, a university, and the Wikimedia chapter. This is the way we have tried to bring the companies on Wikipedia in a safe way. So, quick introduction, uh, who we are. Well, I was the vice president of, of the chapter. This project was uh, also um, conducted on our side by Frida, uh, which was then the president, and I'm sure you, you all know uh, her very well. And basically, this was um, a project that on our side involved very strongly the two of us, which is something I will talk also about later, but now I pass the, the microphone to Federico, which will present Telecom, please. I, am, I work for Telecom Italia. At the moment of the project, I was a member of the corporate communication team. I was in charge of uh, corporate social media. Uh, Telecom Italia is a, a leading uh, Italian telecom operator. We are uh, uh, also in other uh, country, uh, Brazil uh, especially. And uh, now I'm working uh, on uh, brand development project team, uh, on, especially on uh, um, the brand team, uh, our mobile uh, brand. Um, the last uh, but not the least uh, member of, uh, of our project team uh, was uh, Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore di Milano oh, um, professor Nicoletta Vittadini, he, um, who is a, a associate professor of sociology, of communication and culture, and uh, he isn't uh, here. So, um, Basically, uh, what? Oh, no, no, no this. <laughs> yes, this yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, the project uh, um, was divided in uh, um, two oh, phases, and the first uh, was uh, a training phase, uh, where we organized uh, a lot of hours uh, of lesson <laughs> in uh, in room, and uh, Wikimedia Italia was involved uh, in. Uh, Show, showing uh, um, uh, Wikimedia, uh, Wikipedia <laughs> policies uh, to students. Uh, we um, talk uh, to, student, uh, to students uh, about our uh, history, the history of telecommunication in Italy and the history of uh, uh, other telcos uh, in Italy. Um, the person uh, who especially he um, talks about uh, these two teams, uh, was uh, the um, uh, person in charge of uh, our uh, um, historical archive. And uh, we involved also our uh, president, Ghostwriter, who talked about uh, recent history of Telecom Italia. Um, uh, and then uh, we talked about uh, the important, uh, importance of uh, Wikipedia uh, in business uh, and we invited uh, Lundquist, uh, a, a company uh, joined with the KVD group. Um, then uh, a, a Wikipedia administrator uh, talked about uh, his experience and uh, we have a visit uh, in our uh, um, historical archive in uh, Turin. Then the editing phase where the students uh, were divided into two groups, uh, we edited the Telecom Italia uh, articles in Italian uh, mainly, and in English, uh, and then the related uh, articles, uh, other companies uh, like uh, um, Stiepel, Tetis, um, for us are uh, historical company in Italy. And so, basically, uh, the idea of this project was to have, to propose to this professor from uh, Università Cattolica to uh, make available the possibility to uh, have a bachelor thesis around Wikipedia. And so we were able to, we were able to find six interested students in doing this work about Wikipedia. 
and uh, um, and this you can see a picture here, and they did this work as their uh, disserta dissertation thesis for for their bachelor, and. Uh, Again, there was a strong focus on the historical archive of telecom, which is huge, uh, because if you uh, look at the history of telecommunication in Italy, there were in the past many, many companies that they then merged in a single company, which was uh, state controlled, and uh, in the late 90s was privatized and become after Telecom Italia. So Telecom Italia inherited all, all the historical archives of these companies, so we are talking about uh, materials that go back to the beginning of the last century. And we wanted to assess this material, we think this material is important, and how we do that? Uh, well, we didn't find uh, uh, fancy people to, <laughs> to say this line for us, so let's say, let's follow the advice of Mono, the monkey, and the idea was be very transparent and everything is going to work well. Even if it's not uh, so easy or straightforward. So how we try to avoid non-neutral point of view? We tried to let everybody know what we were going to do in advance. We tried to um, in, uh, involve the all other community, all the community uh, as far as we could. For example, one thing that we have uh, done, we have created this template that was saying that these students were uh, editing their article as a part of a project for their, for their thesis. For example, we put uh, a line that in that template that says, look, since they are editing, maybe from the university, they could, could be uh, editing using the same IP address. Because university have uh, one single IP address when, when uh, they, they go on the internet, so you may find also this, uh, this thing. And these are uh, separate people. They, they are not sub puppets. And uh, when there was updating of the article, um, they, they put a statement on the talk page before starting to edit it, saying, we are going, we are, hi, I am user whatever, and I'm going to edit uh, this, uh, this article, and uh, please uh, ask me question, please put your comments here. And also we requested uh, two peer reviews. Uh, the peer review is also part for the feature article process. Uh, in the end, none of the article were featured, but there were two of them that, were, that, were, uh, that went through this uh, uh, peer review process. And basically what we tried to do was this gated approach, to get the company um, uh, history and company material, uh, like images, uh, photos, and so on, on Wikipedia, passing through the students, passing through a university, and we, as a Wikimedia chapter, were supporting the students in what they uh, were going to do. And uh, now, I pass again the word to, to Federico uh, because it was really important for us uh, that we did this together because this is the spirit we have, we have followed in doing all this project and we also uh, wanted to show this kind of spirit here. So please, Federico. Really, we are, um, the most important re results for us uh, was uh, um, the enrichment, enrichment of uh, references uh, in uh, Telecom Italia article. Oh, where uh, um, before the project uh, we had only um, for, uh, 40 references. Now uh, I think they are uh, about uh, 140, 150. Uh, we uploaded uh, uh, 20 images, uh, about 10 from our uh, historical archive. Oh, and um, uh, then uh, we have also a mapping uh, uh, about Telecom Italia presence uh, in uh, Wikipedia with uh, all uh, um, historical company, uh, companies uh, uh, related to Telecom. Okay, and we learned something about, about this uh, um, whole process. Well, uh, the first thing, as I said before, 
we don't know, even if the project has gone well, and one thing that uh, we didn't put in the slides, all the six students eventually got their bachelor with, with, with honors. They, it's, it's also <laughs> because, uh, yes, uh, so cum laude. And it was also because they have already <laughs> very good grades uh, before, and, uh, but the, the work was appreciated by the university. And uh, they also had a good uh, uh, outcome from, from their, their thesis because either they were able to find a, a job or they choose to continue to, to study with a master. And, but we don't know if this is going to scale easily. As I said, this uh, uh, project um, had a lot of involvement on our side, especially on uh, from Frida and myself, and this is related to the, uh, to the last point. Um, there was a really direct communication because there was only six students. We set up a mailing list uh, which was private uh, to give them a safe space for any kind of question. And we don't know if it's easy to do the same thing for, say, let's say, all the companies in Italy. Okay? We don't know if this model doesn't really look like it's easy to scale. And uh, one other thing that I would like to point out it's, uh, there is the need the, to explain to many people, at least in Italy, that uh, Wikipedia article is not a Facebook page. I put this actually to say that one thing we were very lucky was that on the company side, Federico and through him, all the department uh, really already knew that Wikipedia is not Facebook and it is useful. But um, basically, uh, when you talk with uh, with uh, people in in, uh, in the corporate world, they, er, they hear the word Wikipedia and they say, oh, this is social media stuff, okay? Uh, so I think this is one thing that you want to point out. And again, the last point was uh, that the interaction, you should expect that the interaction follow some more corporate style. So something more formal, um, some, and for example, uh, Federico approached for, with the idea, approach Frida, which was the chair of the chapter, because for companies, and this is also true for everybody who has some glam experience, that if you are just a random guy, you probably are uh, less listened to than if you say, oh, look, I am part of a uh, Wikimedia chapter, okay? So expect these kind of things. Uh, and uh, uh, again, that's um, basically it. Uh, this was also presented to our members and I think now it's time for questions, right? Okay, a little bit more, but then we'll get the questions real quick. Actually, the last portion, the, the future part of it, we'll get questions. Yeah, we have huge questions. We only have less than half an hour left. Less than half an hour, okay. So I will, I will speed through my last, thanks guys, by the way. This is yeah. awesome. Um, I'll speed through the last couple of slides and there are just a couple before. We'll, it'll turn into discussion. Um, so we, this has been organized sort of as past, present, future. And so the future, well, it hasn't happened yet, and the future is not set, so <laughs> I wanted us to discuss what that's going to look like. But a couple of things. Notice that I've put this strange phrase up there, whatever we're going to call it. This is because I think, and this gets to Andrew's early slide where he showed the X, Y axis consideration. The problem is we don't really have vocabulary that everybody agrees upon or are clear to understand. I am somebody who spends a lot of time writing about this topic, and I find myself mixing up the phrases all the time and trying to explain what they mean. Conflict of interest, paid editing, paid advocacy, there are other phrases too. Um, they're not great agreement on what these things necessarily mean. And uh, Andrew's slide got to a part of the explanation of why that's difficult. But even that didn't show everything. It didn't, um, English didn't discuss bright line too much, you know, wiki PR, bad, because they are going anonymous. Um, but a PR firm that follows the rules is a pay advocate, but can contribute meaningfully. So terminology is difficult. And on, the, on, both, on their side too, I mean, the difference between PR and marketing is not always clear, even to people in the industry, even if at the, at, at the extreme, tr cl classical traditional public relations is different from advertising or marketing, but there's a lot of uh, blurriness in between. So trying to define terms better would be nice. Here is a uh, sneak preview. I mentioned before that I had additional projects that I'm driving along with the group of folks who are involved in the Donovan House project and the public relations statement. Uh, There's going to be the publication of an ebook coming up 
uh, in the first week of September. Here's the, what the front page will approximately look like and what it's called. Uh, here's the table of contents along with a description of some of what's going to be in there. This is intended to build upon the work that was done by CAIPR with their document from a couple of years ago, updated uh, this year. If you're going to read one thing first, read that one. Uh, that definitely sets the table, gives you an idea of how Wikipedia considers this and how you, if you are a professional, how you should consider Wikipedia. But it doesn't really give you um, the next step. So the purpose of this manual is to evaluate certain common case scenarios. What it happens, like, can I just edit if I only have a small factual edit to make? Um, what about vandalism? What if an editor disagrees with me? So uh, I, I know some of you in this room have read it. Uh, I've been circulating it, uh, trying to get as much feedback as I can. And so while it's essentially finished, it'll still have a few tweaks. Uh, you'll hear more about it from me in uh, the start of September. So here's where we should get to questions. I've just thrown some questions on here that I think kind of inform my thinking about it. I sort of have answers to some of these. You probably don't know what all these phrases mean, so if you get curious about one, you can ask. Um, someone had a hand up here, right? And you are this man. All right, what is that? Um, question regarding the Italian Wikipedia and mm -hmm. uh, Telecom Italia. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, from what you've explained, it sounds like it's been a very productive outcome. I've just got a couple of questions. Firstly, do, does the Italian Wikipedia have wiki projects? And if so, did you engage with them and how? And secondly, regarding the archive material, is there a policy regarding no original research? And if so, how did you overcome that potential issue? Um, uh, well, I will start with... You can use the question. Uh, well, I will start with the last question about the historical archive. Uh, most of the material were images, like uh, really old photographs that were in, a, in the historical archive. There were a lot of work which was really hard about the brands, the, the possibility to have the old brands and, and uh, put them uh, on Wikimedia Commons with all the permission cleared. And that's, the difficulty was uh, related to the fact that uh, Telecom Italia Having inherited all the uh, previous brands and logos from all the other companies, a uh, really uh, huge quantity quantity of uh, brands and the other copyrighted or trademark uh, things, and um, so uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure that I get your question about original research because it was not like papers or I didn't realize it was primarily photographs. So I was thinking there was old documentation which hadn't been published in a, an independent reliable source that could be difficult to it. If it was mainly or exclusively photographs, then obviously that wouldn't apply. For, for, example, for example, for the brands, there was this really huge work that uh, the students have done about researching this website with the registrations number of the trademarks which were not so straightforward, like it was hard to find which was the registration number for logo 123 and, uh, and then link these this kind of things. Okay. And about the projects, yes, we tried, the um, students tried to engage the community through the village pump, through the help desk, if they have some technical question through the projects. And the response was not so huge. Uh, like not um, everybody rushed uh, to the page, but that's what uh, normally happens on on all Wikipedia. Okay, thank you. So okay, we got two. I see two questions here. You and then you next. So go uh, for it. I've got a I've got a question very closely related to the question you asked, and then it relates to um, written uh, rep uh, references to written sources in the Italian. Of course. Italian, this Italian example is just one case study. I think we should make sure we have questions about the bigger issue I'm that we're talking about. I just don't think it's fair to all the other folks who came here for the bigger issue. I'm we drilled down on the Italian one too much. I'm going to expand it now because. Okay. Um, so make sure it's, it's a bigger there's, question. There's, there's another company called Murray and Roberts. Mm -hmm. they, 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 someone from the company who clearly loves it, the history of it very much wrote a whole lot of stuff in it. Um, none of it was cited, mm -hmm. but they clearly knew what they're talking about. This actually flagged the article and landed, landed up getting deleted, which 
and if you go away from that, I'll say that again, I'll it again. Um, so if, if, you're, if you are, say, a company and you're using sources, you can't necessarily only use sources from your own website. You've got to use external sources. How do you go with that? You look for reliable sources, uh, you look for, uh, like so in the work that I do, uh, we always, one of the first things we explain to a client is that we're going to almost exclusively use journalistic sources. There may be occasions where a press release can be useful to verify a detail we can't find somewhere else. But if it's demonstrating the significance of an initiative, like if you won an award and the only press, and the only press around it was the press release you put out and the press release that the awarding body put out, that award uh, was not judged important enough to get mentioned. So. That's part of the answer. Your question? Hi. I to... Could you get up at the back? I think it's really hard to hear the question. Mm. Stand up. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Okay, I have two questions. Uh, one, William Hugh, one for Christoph. Uh, I'm totally unrelated, sorry. So. <laughs> Fine. Um, William, the question for you is your presentation, the work you've been doing, and the PR firms you've been working with primarily are corporate. Mm -hmm. it's yes. Very, very important corporate focus. Right. Is there a very plan? Or is it being considered to expand this to politically? So government information ministries, think tanks, lobbyists, etc., who all come under the same issue. That's question one. Mm -hmm. Question two to Christoph. If I understand correctly what Chris Boyd is saying in terms of your project on Orange, France Telegram, etc., um, you don't follow in pressure media the same rule and prayer line that things have to be on top page. So how do you how do you feel about that pros and cons of that? Because when I listened to William speaking, you said two things that were interesting. One was not during the speech that the sixth pillar is one who cares the most wins, and the other you said during the speech that when you are working with talk page, it's sometimes quite hard to engage volunteers because frankly you don't always care about the share price of X Y Z company. So those two things together suggest that if you do have it open and a page editor can advocate for his company on the main page, you're going to have a natural imbalance, a deep natural imbalance, because you care much, much more than the most, most of the volunteers. Whereas the talk page uh, fix, to my mind, forces this kind of balance to be cemented. But I'm interested to know your pro views on pros and cons from the French Wikipedia side. You want to go first? Okay, so that discussion with French Wikipedia, let me go back to what Wikipedia is. Just to remind you, perhaps you have forgot at some point, Wikipedia is a French encyclopedia that anyone can read. And when that was set up, we said, in the anyone, there might be people that want to do us harm. So we will have policies like the supporting references. Those do apply to companies. And those do apply to the feminism or POV version. And we are not asking anyone to uh, say, are you um, a member of a political party? Because we want to know what our POV is. But we are kind of saying, you're for a company, so your POV is not as, is, is worse than the other. So, and we can't rely on our volunteers that are spending, I mean, we can sustain a huge amount of time uh, contributing to the job they like. And on top of that, we are saying anyone except people from companies candidates, so you should spend more time just to onboard and help companies. Let them eat it. Let the people from the company eat it. With the same risk, you have to be the board, you have to use references. Can you comment on the natural imbalance point? Or what? The point about there being an imbalance. So because the volunteers don't really care about corporate history, for example, yeah. there is a deep imbalance where yeah. the people who care are the people who are paid. Yeah, but it's the same with them. I mean, the people who most care about, no, but really, I mean, I saw someone who went, yeah. I'm sorry, <laughs> the, one, the one people that cares about spending weeks and months digitizing their collection is cloud. We are not doing that. We can't. We are not doing that. Uh, if we have, uh, if the risk, uh, risk museum, I'm sorry, Sandra, I'm saying that really poorly, uh, is having so much contact with Wikipedia, it's not because Wikimedians are spending very a lot of time on that, because we can even spend time with the museum to do that. If the Buddhist archive did that, because at some point we help them do that. But for companies, we are saying we don't want to help you. We're making it harder and harder and harder. I think you're using the kind of other things exist on, which is, you know, if other people do it, well, that means it's fine. I don't think that's the point. Do you agree that there is a natural imbalance 
in corporate articles. Maybe not on the open Like with the Pokemon with every bias towards fanism. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. If I hear what you're saying, you're saying, you're saying there's a national imbalance in French Wikipedia because of this, and it's more balanced in English. It, it, so, no, the funny thing is, I can make the opposite argument because what happens. What I'm, what I'm saying, and then you can argue against it. What I'm trying to say is, if you go through a talk page, you are creating a balance because you're forcing a volunteer to get information. No, no, no. You're forcing no one. You're forcing no one, right. No, no, maybe they don't, and then you can't put it on the page. But unless you achieve that, here's my you achieve a balance. Okay, so so here's, here's my argument for why I think the English language way of doing things actually might be providing a very unbalanced uh, dynamic. And I think you see it a lot. Is that what happens is the passionate folks who are editing are the ones who think that the environmental record of Exxon is the most important thing to have, and 60% of the article is the bad things that Exxon does, right? So. To me, the reason why this is an important dialogue to have with these companies is that I think for too long, Wikipedians have um, neglected a lot of these articles and let them read really badly, yep. right? That there is this streak in Wikipedians, at least English language, I should say English language Wikipedians, that American journalists get accused of is that we're quite, quite quote unquote liberal because we go out of our way to make big, powerful Fortune 500 companies look bad because they've got PR engines to counteract that if they want to. So I think there is that culture in English Wikipedia that I'd like to try to try to rebalance. And that's why I think I think the opposite of what you say. I think because you don't allow for corporations to uh, get more involved in the talk page, and we don't have a community in English language Wikipedia of taking up the charge to make corporate articles better, we have really poor articles about Fortune 500 companies in Wikipedia. So I want to elaborate actually on something that Christoph had said earlier. Uh, I think an interesting dynamic between the way things work on the English Wikipedia and the way they work in some of the European languages of Wikipedia, so French, German, and I think Swedish. In the US, where there is the First Amendment, companies can say just about any damn thing they want to short of fire in a crowded theater. Uh, in Europe, uh, where I'm not an expert in regulation, but I understand that you know, the, the claims that companies can make in their communications and advertising is much more tightly regulated, more restricted. The theory that I've kind of been working out with Andrew and Christophe a little bit over the last few weeks, and especially yesterday as we talked about this, is that I think this actually goes back to the, the First Amendment here, which, you know, that, which there of course exists in the U.S., and the U.S. exerts a, you know, very large influence on the English Wikipedia. I think that because companies can say whatever they want to, the culture has developed a greater skepticism of what is being said by companies. And so Wikipedians who have that, you know, try to act as the check, speaking truth to power, expect companies to be lying. Whereas in Europe, I think, um, Wikipedians know that those companies are being close, more closely watched. And so they, there's a great expectation that they will be honest. And so that's why they can do what they want to. And I better ask, answer some hands, because I see hands going up. You, sir, are in the front. Yes, and I will stand up, and I'm pretty loud. I want to bring up the point you are talking about, PR people and pe lawyers. Lawyers can get very involved, and they can involve, get involved in not articles about the particular company, they can get involved with issues about products, chemicals, uh, whatever, and then if you have a court fight, you get lawyers ethically going to the talk page and saying, hey, that description of that is wrong, mm -hmm. and then there's a lawyer on the other side saying, yes, it's right, change, asking everybody else to change the references, change the wording of the articles, but aren't we Wikipedians that not involved in that kind of a fight? Aren't we put upon to try to do something about what these guys are asking for? I think it would be the role of Wikipedia to make an informed judgment call, to look at the facts and make a, a ruling on that, the same way they would in any content dispute. Yes, I've seen that also. Okay. By the way, you had asked about political, and I have had political clients. It's a lot less. Speaking for the U.S., um, I tend to work with campaigns, because campaigns are able to spend money that the government offices can't. 
And uh, working is usually focused on an individual. Working on articles about individuals is harder for a lot of reasons I don't have time to explain than articles about companies, partly because articles about companies are less personal. And uh, other problem with political is that campaign politics often is done in the shadows. And the work that we do is in, uh, you know, in the sunlight of a talk page. And so I won't take on a project where they want no fingerprints. Like no fingerprints is a pretty common phrase in um, you know, like politicking. And I know a lot of people who you know, they practice the dark arts as a matter of business. And that does not match with the Wikipedia's policies. So those people are just doing it anonymously and I don't know what to do about it. So Sir. Can I say in other words, you're saying that your best guess is we'll never be able to control that part of it. Not entirely. The best thing you can do is provide an alternative for people who yeah, want to follow the rules. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, very, very short and practical question because we are talking about the big PR companies and the big companies working on that. And that's, that's a nice thing because you can set up policies and there will be fault within the company if it's set. That, that's a nice thing. Uh, I have, but uh, we have to also face the thing that there are a lot of small companies and the small firms working that and they are doing paid editing, whatever you want or not. And that's, that's visible on the, on, on the network. And the question, the practical question is, because uh, I think in, in, at least in some that's in Polish Wikipedia, we, we do not allow at the moment the company accounts, uh, yeah, because it should be individual. I saw that in the German <coughs> one, uh, you have a policy of having the, uh, the up, approved company account. So at least if they do that, and OK, sticking to the rules is another thing, but we have on the first view. That was added by the, by the company itself. And the question, the practical question is to, to, to all of us is how, how do you manage in, in different uh, areas that kind of thing? And, or, or, or are we coming to the, to the way that probably, because I'm, I'm thinking we should allow this official account to at least have an overview yeah. of control of what's going on. Arnie, yeah. yeah. Just to word on, on that one, because I know some yeah. stuff about the German Wikipedia and also about uh, companies being active there. So the, the verified, verified account approach of the German Wikipedia has indeed the, the advantage that everything companies are doing is, is public, transparent, and transparent in a technical way. So you can do uh, what you just described earlier with these uh, Twitter accounts that see what ed anonymous edits come out of the uh, Congress, you can do the same, and there is an account doing that for all edits made by verified accounts <coughs> in German Wikipedia. So you can let them edit the article on their own, and you get that attention, attention that you were asking for through talk page interaction, just through this process of verifying these accounts. So it's machine readable uh, which accounts are from corporations and which not. So I think that could would be the better solution instead of this bright line stuff that you can't really enforce and can't really follow. It's really hard to, to detect. Uh, so it will create more mess, I suppose. Yeah, I suppose. There's a hand in the back. Someone still have a question? No? Was? Uh, is this you, sir? Oh, uh, well, gosh. I want to get someone in the back. We, yes, go for it back, sir. Uh, just a two short question about the e-book about data. Yeah. First one, is it possible to have the uh, translated also to Italian? I would like to, to help. I would need a translator for it. Uh, I mean, I am interested in that. So, yeah, right now it's just in English, but I think it'd be. Okay. Here's the deal. I should add that ebook is written for the English language Wikipedia. I don't myself have expertise. This would be where, say, Christian, for example, or maybe yourself could offer. I would love to get some advice on how to adapt it for other languages. And that was, that was the second question. We, uh, uh, well, a user of ours on, in, on the Italian Wikipedia made a semi-serious guide to pay the editing. Mm -hmm. So if, if we can contribute because... I would love to see that. I, I'm sure there's a way to do that. Cool. Let's talk afterward. And you had a question, right? Uh, no question. Or a comment? Just, just a reminder, uh, it's not, not only companies we are talking about. Mm -hmm. Several weeks mm -hmm. ago, a guy from worldwide.com talked to me and said they have a very bad page on Wikipedia, outdated information, short, and some criticism. And they are in fear to change something. Yeah because there could be more criticism and they have a main amount of traffic coming from Wikipedia page to their page and they are fear to these donors. So they, he asked me for guidelines and I'm hoping this will have an outcome to help him. Oh yeah, the ebook should be helpful, I think. Yeah, uh, excellent. Yeah. I have no hand. Just, just to add one more thing to, to that aspect, because I think among Wikipedians there's a perception that the companies are doing aggressively stuff on, on Wikipedia and what we cannot see is probably 
done in hiding. Uh, just to give you one example for the, for the opposite, I was working for a, for a pharma company a year ago uh, on an issue and they detect that the article actually says that a, new, that a drug is actually uh, causing cancer because some random uh, medicine uh, person said that at some point and get cited on that. But the correction that days later came out from the official uh, official uh, regulator said there's no point that this is true, but the Wikipedia article still says it, and that company is just scared to death to even send an email to the OTRS system. They weren't, I, I weren't even ready to talk to them about talk page exposure because nobody could decide that within that global big pharma company. And this draft for an email to the OTRS system just pointing out there is an issue maybe someone wants to have a look at it. Here's a source citing the exact opposite of what's stated, stated in the article, and this letter was never sent because nobody within the large organization had the guts to actually do that. So at least large companies, and I think the same is true for large PR agencies, are really trying to get things right, and before they do something wrong, they do nothing, and this is something that should not be in our interest as Wikipedians because there are a lot of errors and mistakes in existing corporate Yeah, that, that story makes me sad because yeah. they're afraid of the wrong things. Yeah. And I get this, sometimes a, a client, a potential client comes to me and asks, like, oh, so it'll be on the talk page? And I'm like, look, no one ever looks at the talk page. And by the way, you're doing it the right way. The, they're afraid of blowback just by being in public. No fingerprints is what more people are familiar with, unfortunately, trying to change that culture. Can I, can I add one thing? There was a sequence videos for, for our project. Basically, we didn't talk very much about uh, this project, also in the international uh, community, even if from two years ago, two, last year and two years ago, it started two years ago. And basically, because from the company, there was a lot of fear, that, a lot of, let's wait, let's wait, let's wait, and let's wait a little, let's wait a little, let's wait a little, wait a little until the project actually finished. And, uh, just to say also about the corporate style of interaction before came, coming here. The project has already been presented in public at our General Assembly, for example. And, but again, uh, since there was this like, approach before coming here and talking with William, Christoph, and Andrew about talking about this, we did another passage. Okay, guys, we want to present this project uh, at uh, Wikimania. And are you okay with that? Uh, because there, there's a lot of fear. Yes. And two quick. Are we, are we out? Uh, uh, question. Sorry, I had a question. Why do you think of questions? No, um, how about the technology and the um, Do you guys, um, you talked about the content, you talked about the people, you talked about the writers and, and the editors. The technology has, especially now, algorithms have been designed to to verify references, to validate, uh, let's say, one reference against the other, let's say, which source is more valuable, which source is not that valuable, which article is more positive and which article is not positive. Do you guys look at technology companies or tools that help you give, uh, give uh, scores to such articles that you're uh, referring to or, or give you opinion about or let you choose between uh, I think it's part of the editorial process. You know, you, uh, it's, there's, no, there's never going to be a rigid way to answer that. This is why I value the conversation that Wikipedians can have with company representatives. One person makes a proposition, somebody else either agrees with it or offers a different point of view. There certainly are often times where we have competing sources that have different information. And sometimes Wikipedia will choose to say, source A says this, source B says that. That's kind of the best thing you can do. Thank you. Well, go for it. Did you get that previous part of the two things? Doesn't we believe that people in the company are different from us? They're not. Uh, I used to consult for a pharma company, and at some point he asked me to talk with him about what we, they could do on Wikipedia. Uh, local regulations makes that they can't do anything. But when I arrived in his office for the meeting, he had the Wikimedia strategy claim printed, and he read that thoroughly, even perhaps even more so than me. And today now he is editing on itself, not about the company, it's eating on top of the lines. Uh, and I hope <coughs> that most of us in the room are actually working for like, a job. So you are actually doing some penalty at some point, perhaps. Uh, so we don't, must not fear that the people in front of us are evil all the time. They, most of them are not. They are normal people that you can talk with and you can be like.
Uh, the second thing is uh, benefiting, uh, as we are talking about it, and even now, uh, we're talking about companies, but the framework is not only on companies. Uh, only you talk about, um, I mean, you talk about the React. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, it was, sorry. Uh, talk about the React. Uh, in fact, we have the same with the uh, National Association for Ruby. They would love to contribute to Wikipedia, but they can because the framework is not adapted to them. And there are a lot of organizations that are not companies, but they are organizations that can't edit because of the framework. So, painting is not just restricted to what we have on the top of our mind, which is the big scandal we had with Wikipedia and so on. It's much, much wider than that. I think we're down to the last 30 seconds for each person, but uh, the one thing I just want to say is, um, as Christoph said, I was quite impressed when I was in that meeting at Donovan House that these were not just PR digital specialists who were hoping to get involved with Wikipedia and were really Facebook and Twitter experts. These folks were using, were talking like you folks are here. They were using acronyms like AFC, AFD. They knew the culture of adventure. They knew the deletion struggles that people have. It was amazing to me. It was quite eye-opening. So my, my point is that it's, it's quite, we've made a pretty big leap in terms of getting these PR companies to sign on in the English Wikipedia to say, we're keeping a hands-off approach to the actual content. We're going to stick to the talk pages, if that. There were some companies that even said, we're not going to talk, touch the talk pages because we're not confident our employees know the difference between a talk page and an article page. So they don't even want to risk the embarrassment of accidentally editing the page. So the question I have for English Wikipedians, at least, is now what is our responsibility now to step up to the plate to make sure that those articles are accurate? We care a lot when John Siedenthaler's article is inaccurate and his name is tarnished, or an individual with BLPs. But for these articles that we know stick, they're not good. But we don't allow the folks who know the most and could make those articles better to touch them. Do we as Wikipedians have a responsibility now, whether it's by our numbers or our policies or through other projects, to try to make those articles better? Because I do think there's a culture in English Wikipedia of letting it, you know, letting us stick it to the van and letting these big corporations just kind of fly in the wind and not have good content on Wikipedia. And I think that has to change, not because we should make those guys feel better, but because it's a better Wikipedia. Do you have a final statement? I think I, think I just spent two minutes talking, so it was a long first second. So, okay. so I have one last thing that I would conclude with, and that is simply by having this conversation, and the more, more, more we have more conversations, and the more we do it in public, and the more that Wikipedia makes the rules of engagement clear, which is always a challenge, of course, but the more this conversation is had, the more that companies will hear about it, and they will feel pressure to follow these rules. One of the interesting things I've noticed out of the, you know, post-releasing this statement was I have had uh, potential clients come to me or other agencies come to me and ask me what I thought of it. Had I heard of this? When, when, when someone starts coming and asking you about a project that you led, you know that it's got around and it's in the bloodstream. The challenge now is to keep that conversation going, and I hope this panel uh, helps contribute to that. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot.